And so the means, according to Rome, by which a person is justified initially is through the instrumental cause of baptism, which, when administered by the church, works ex opera operato, which means by the working of the works, virtually automatically. And in this sacrament, justifying grace is infused or poured into the soul of the recipient. But even then, for that soul to arrive at a state of justification, the person who receives this infusion of justifying grace or the infused righteousness of Christ, if you will, must cooperate with and assent to, cooperare et assentare is what Trent says, to this grace in order to be justified. And if those things happen, then the person is in a state of grace, in a state of justification, until or unless that person should proceed to commit a mortal sin. And mortal sins are distinguished from venial sins in the sense that a mortal sin is so serious that it has the capacity to kill the justifying grace that is in your soul. So you see, you're justified for a little while until you commit a mortal sin which destroys the grace of justification, but don't despair. If you do destroy the justification by mortal sin, it can be fixed because you can be justified again through another sacrament, which was the sacrament of penance. Again, the church defines the sacrament of penance as the second plank of justification for those who have made shipwreck of their souls. And so when a person commits mortal sin, they go to the priest, they go through confession, they get uh, absolution, and then at the end of that time they are given certain assignments to perform in order to be restored to a state of grace which assignments may involve saying so many Our Fathers or so many Hail Marys or going on a pilgrimage or giving alms or whatever the case may be, so that when this penance is done, these works that must be done in order to be justified provide for the penitent sinner a certain type of merit, the merit that is called meritum de congrua, or congruous merit, which is distinguished from condign merit. Condign merit is the kind of merit that is so meritorious that if God is a just God, He would be required to reward it. Congruous merit does not rise to the level of condign merit, doesn't impose an obligation upon God to reward it, but it is congruous or fitting for God to reward this merit by restoring a person to a state of grace. And if God did not restore the person, God would be acting in an incongruous manner, in a manner that is not fitting. So you see, these works of satisfaction that are required by the sacrament of penance were at the very heart of the controversy of the 16th century that started over the business of the sale of indulgences, and that all had to do with the idea that by making donations for the building of St. Peter's. This would satisfy some of the requirements to perform works of satisfaction, and the rest, of course, is history. 
And so you have for Rome faith and works. Grace and merit. And what about Christ? Now, again, Rome does not believe that a person can be justified or saved apart from grace or apart from the work of Christ. The monk Pelagius, who objected so strenuously to St. Augustine's teachings on grace in early church history, argued that we are capable without any help from divine grace to lead perfect lives. And he argued this way, that since God requires perfection, he would certainly not require the creature to do something that he was inherently incapable of doing. And he said, so people can live perfect lives even without grace, and not only can they, but he argued that some, in fact, had achieved that perfection without the help of grace. Now, he didn't disparage the significance of grace. Pelagius said that grace facilitates righteousness. It's not required, but it helps. And, of course, Pelagius, with his heretical view of the denial of the fall, saying that the constituent nature of man was not changed by Adam's fall, was roundly and soundly condemned by the Roman Catholic Church at Florence, at Orange, again at the Council of Trent in the first three canons of Session 6, and as recently as the Catholic Catechism. And sometimes Protestants treat Catholics as if they were unbridled Pelagians. They're not. They're bridled Pelagians. <laughs> they don't get all that Pelagianism out of their system. They are at best semi-Pelagianism. Semi-Pelagianism was founded by Pelagius' cousin, Semi. But Rome, again, says we need the help of Christ. And the help of Christ comes to us through the sacraments, which give us an infusion of the righteousness of Christ. And when the righteousness of Christ is poured into me, once again, I must cooperate with that and assent to it in such a way that I live without blemish. And, of course, uh, Luther had his crisis experience when he went to Rome in 1510 and 11 and visited the cathedral there, which was the uh, see of uh, St. Peter before St. Peter's was completed, the Lateran Church, which boasted the sacred stairs that had been brought back allegedly from Jerusalem, and he went to the sacred stairs because Rome had a, a system of belief saying that if a pilgrim went up the stairs on his knees saying the Our Father and Hail Mary on every step, that when he got to the top and completed this task, he would receive so many indulgences worth so many years of release from purgatory. 